I'm trying now to crowd uh, 50 years of history into half an hour. So if I overlook some people and some events, you can correct me in your minds or by speech. I was born into a segregation of South Africa and completely socialized into it. I still remember standing on the station of Peter Maddisburg, the very station where Mahatma Gandhi was thrown off the train, and being utterly astounded to see an Indian woman and a white woman in affectionate conversation. Little could I suspect, could that teenager suspect that 40 years later I'd be standing side by side with Fatima Mir protesting outside the city hall. <laughs> So the integration of the, the segregation of those days was socially as bad and sometimes as bad as and sometimes even worse than what occurred under apartheid. And of course, politically, economically, and educationally, segregation governed South Africa. There was white franchise with some few voting rights for African and colored males in the Cape. Economically, there was a total white monopoly of land, industry, and commerce, and the legislation was already building up intensely. For example, in 1923, there was the Native Urban Areas Act, amended seven times and consolidated once, and described as by an historian as one of the most complex pieces of legislation ever devised anywhere. Education leaves a case of white privilege and others having limited access, and Africans attended mainly mission schools. The black reactions in those days were, first of all, the launching of the South African Native National Congress in 1912, which became the ANC in 1922, and dealt mainly in moral persuasion to bring about change in South Africa. There was, at the same time, shortly afterwards, the Industrial and Commercial Union of Clemens Kedalia trying to struggle for some kind of economic equality or at least justice in labor relations. We remember too that some years before, before 1914, Mahatma Gandhi had waged his uh, campaign for justice in South Africa. When we think of the reaction of the churches, we uh, notice mainly synodal resolutions and declarations on the part of Anglican and Protestant churches. Later on, the Anglican church took the lead in more vigorous opposition, inspired by people like the then father Trevor Huddleston and Michael Scott, Bishop Clayton and Alan Payton, the layperson, a lay leader. Many of these were inspired by an earlier experience of Christian social philosophy in England. My own church, the Catholic Church, felt itself to be a minority in a somewhat alien community, gratified to be allowed freedom to evangelize and very, very cautious about rocking the boat. Perhaps he felt that the bark of Peter couldn't stand the waves as well as certain other barks. Catholic ecumenism was almost non-existent. There was the underlying simmering animosity towards other Christian denominations dating back to 400 years and uh, represented these days by what goes on in Glasgow between the two football teams there, Rangers and Celtic. Rangers being mainly a Presbyterian inspiration and Celtic mainly Roman Catholic, stemming from a modest old boys team. A uh, Presbyterian minister, a good friend of mine, told me about the Rangers supporter who died and knocked at the pearly gates. And Peter said, well, uh, can you give an account of your life? Yes, he said, I've been a good church goer. We've read the Bible at home. I've cared for my wife and my children. Fine, said St. Peter. Did you ever do anything really courageous? Yes, he said. I waved a, a ranger's banner in the middle of the Celtic crowd. 
Well done, said Peter. And how long ago was that? About one minute ago. <laughs> We weren't quite as unecumenical as that, but on the track in that direction. I come now to apartheid and divided into three periods nominated from the kinds of opposition that grew up to apartheid. First of all, the Congress movement of 1945 to 1960, the Black Consciousness period of roughly 1965 to 1976, and then the revival of the ANC from 1978 to 1994. If I single out the ANC, I apologize to other liberation movements, but I think historically we must agree that the ANC was the most powerful influence in what happened later. The Congress movement was introduced by some uh, agitation during the last years of the um, government prior to that of the National Party in 1948. I think the promising, the really significant event was the formation of the ANC Youth League in 1945, 44, 45. And such names occurred in those days. Anton Lembede, the first leader who died very young, Oliver Tambo, Walter Sisulu, A. Pimda, Jordan Gubane, Nelson Mandela, Joe Matthews, and Robert Sabukwe were the Young Lions of 1944-1945. There was housing agitation in 1944-45. There was a miners' strike in 1945, promoted by the then Communist Party, and very strongly by the miners' trade unions. There was powerful Indian agitation in Natal, in connection with what was called in those days Indian penetration into white areas. And this was all in the time of prior to apartheid segregation. We remember the South African Indian Congress and the Natal Indian Congress. But May 1948 brought the National Party to power and with it the introduction of apartheid, now segregation made ideological and made much more intense. And the uh, legislative mill began to grind. Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act, population registration, group areas, Bantu education, and so on. First under Dr. Milan, then under Mr. G.J. Stradham, who finally achieved the removal of colored persons from the voters' roll. And finally, then again, under Dr. Fravud, from 1958 on. 